the topic for today is building consensus around cloud migration projects. And there is a little bit of a caveat, a twist to that story. And that being basically making use of security and compliance as a tool to build that consensus. So we will kind of go over this throughout the next 40, 45 minutes. And as I said before, if you do have any questions, please feel free to raise them in the Q&A se uh, section. And I will try to make sure I can keep an eye on it. And of course, try to answer um, as, as when I go, go through. Right. So let me get started. A little bit about the um, agenda. So intro is obviously quite straightforward. We will talk a little bit about stakeholders and the importance of the stakeholders in the process of the any sort of cloud migration efforts. We'll talk a little bit about the narrative and some of the historical obstacles and challenges, and also how we can redefine that narrative to fit a better outcome for cloud migration projects. And we will obviously talk a little bit about making use of security and compliance as a consensus tool, right? <clears throat> Excuse me, as a way to build consensus across the different teams. We'll touch on a few examples and best practices, a little bit of summary, and that pretty much wraps up today's session. So the part that everyone likes the most, that's sarcasm, by the way, is talking about himself, so who, who I am. Um, my name is Marcus Strauss. I'm the uh, Chief Product Officer here at Runecast. And I've been in the security and monitoring industry now somewhere around 20 years, maybe a few more. Um, seen and been actively part of several migration projects, both into the cloud, um, expatriating back out of the cloud and back into the cloud again, um, both from a monitoring perspective, but also from a security perspective. So again, um, thanks for, for taking the time and joining me today. Really, this is a little bit more like a informal conversation, things that I've seen throughout my own career, things that we've picked up in the market, things that we speak about with potential customers or with the industry. And really what I wanted to do is kind of wrap these all into a session to share with uh, you, the audience, right? So maybe let's start off with the stakeholders. The challenge of getting everyone on the table the proverbial, uh, fictitious, virtual, physical um, table and agree on something. I think we, we've all been in the position of having to try to get consensus and agreement from a large group of people from various different teams or departments. And I think we all understand how difficult that can be, and often um, a very lengthy process, right? So there are there, there are various different issues or challenges with this. Um, of course, the complexity of the, the the diversity and complexity of the the stakeholder groups, right? So you know, you talk about technical stakeholders, you would generally include business stakeholders. Uh, you will have stakeholders in your end customer, whoever that may be, right? That could be internal, uh, it could be external. Um, throughout every single level of position within the organization, you will have a very, very diverse group of stakeholders that you deal with whenever you start approaching a project or a subject like something like cloud migration, right? Um, so for you know argument's sake, we kind of break these down into three groups for this one. Um, there's many, many different 
groups that we could look at. But for ease of going through this, I'll just pick three, right? So one being the IT team, and their main challenge and concern is obviously the security, data integrity, things like that, which is generally their main obstacle when it comes to, hey, we're migrating workloads from one place to another. How can we make sure that we, you know, we do not lose the data integrity? How can we make sure we um, are not exposed? All of these things are generally part of the IT team's concern. Then we've got the end user, again, which ever one this may be, that could be an internal end user, the teams that are using whatever applications that are running on top of the workloads. It could be external end users, customers. If we are providing some uh, service or solution or SaaS offering back to the market, so that could potentially be an external end user, a customer. And of course, for that particular stakeholder group, usability and potential disruptions are the, the key areas, right? Because of course, even if I'm an uh, internal stakeholder, I do want to ensure that whatever I'm using, whatever that systems, software, um, et cetera, is not disrupted. I can do my, my job, whatever that job may be. And if I'm an end user in form of a customer, then even more so because I might have service level agreements with, um, with you in place, I might have contractual obligations myself um, that might suffer because of disruptions um, or, you know, just because of usability issues. And the interesting kind of site um, topic, but security in, in as a whole, I think has always been a fine line between secure and usable um, with many trade-offs in both directions. And, um, but I think for end users, really usability and the potential disruptions are both key concerns, right? And then we've got the business leaders, right? So that's that's our C-suite, our execs, um, our VPs, business unit leaders, everything that has budgetary um, or overall oversight responsibility. And of course, generally cost, and the return on that investment are some of the biggest concerns, right? So the main point of this, and like I said, we could extend this list um, quite a lot, but in essence, the main point here is we have a fairly varied set of stakeholders who all identify unique concerns and all have unique perspectives. And we can bring this further and we can look at what their individual um, expectations and um, typical requirements would be if we would be looking at a project like migrating workloads to the, to the cloud, right? So from an IT team expectations perspective, um, of course, we would like to have in-house expertise and we need to have in-house expertise because it's really difficult to build and maintain and architect um, net new cloud resources, whether that's lift and shift or whether that's, you know, purchase or whether that's built, um, you do need to have in-house uh, expertise. Um, but there's also some some benefits, right, what, that we're expecting. We're expecting less maintenance. Um, we're expecting increased speed. And by that, I don't necessarily mean just bandwidth speed, um, although that certainly is a topic. But also increased speed in terms of deployment, increased speed of um, patching, uh, increased speed of adopting new technologies, things of that nature, right? All are part of the increased speed, right? And if we're looking at the end user's expectations, we're looking at better availability, faster service, um, again, faster faster everything really. Again, here is faster service in terms of bandwidth, throughput, things of that nature, um, faster access to new versions, uh, things things like that. And then from a from a business leader's perspective, our expectations are quite similar in terms of you know what our overall challenges were. We're looking for a lower, lower total cost of ownership, of course. Um, in a lot of cases, um, the main driver, or at least theoretically the main driver for these um, 
project is cost reduction, or at least the the wishful thinking of cost reduction. I think we all we we have all heard and seen the effects of this not being done right, and effectively certain workloads are more expensive to run in the cloud than they are on premises. So hence why you know we have seen quite quite a number of workloads moving back on premises. But in this particular case, let's assume as a business leader, one of our key expectations is a general lower cost of ownership. But also many business leaders would see this as a growth enabler, right? So again, being able to develop faster, being able to go to market faster, um, being able to make use of newer technology, future proving the business. All of these things are effectively growth enablers. And it's really starting to show how important it is to foster consent amongst you know these different audiences. And some of these can be quite competing interests, right? Um, lower total cost of ownership, for ex example, in a lot of cases would contradict um, things like adding in-house expertise or you know having better availability and faster whatever it is right because these things generally come with a cost premium right so you, you'll you'll see and I'm, I'm sure almost everyone in in the audience is or has had several of these similar conversations in the past where these points can be uh can be quite mutually exclusive and it's really incredibly important to kind of foster that consensus and start understanding what's that common goal and what's you know what what's ideal world going to look like um so when we think about this um it, the the area that i've called here redefining the narrative uh, really is is all about resetting what we consider to be the goal of those migration efforts right and it, it it will help kind of framing using security and compliance as a as a consensus tool, right? So it, when we look at this as the archetypical progression of um, historic and cloud migration projects, I think even including the um, the little potholes and pitfalls that we have here, I think um, that's uh, it's a fairly fairly accurate representation of what we what we deal with right so generally speaking you're looking at um, many many different hurdles and many different roadblocks between you and your goal right in this particular case our goal is the cloud migration right that's that's the the, the goal right um, and that has been like this since I guess since very early on when we started migrating workloads from on-premises into into cloud environments the the goal post has always been have i migrated have i gotten my workload in 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 the cloud which of course it definitely is one of the important factors right but that has always been the overarching goal right this is the outcome this is what what you want to achieve right but it causes problems in terms of all of the different challenges, especially in the past. I mean, it, things have certainly changed over the last number of years, but I, re I remember way back, um, and we still have that problem with just workloads being configured really, really badly, right? Um, but especially in the early days um, of cloud workload migration, so moving, moving stuff from on-prem to the cloud, there were so many resources that were publicly available and accessible from anywhere that were running in the cloud that were configured with default credentials. Um, I, I remember one incident, I think it was MongoDB at the time, uh, the default installation script um, included, I think the username was admin and the password was either password or there was no password at all, which was part of the, um, the standard deployment. And uh, there were thousands upon thousands of MongoDB instances running in the cloud with the default credentials, right? Um, now, of course, 
a large chunk of these had absolutely nothing on them and there was no there was no sensitive data or anything like that but there was quite a quite a number of them that actually did have production level data on them um, but in addition it obviously it also causes other problems with the ability once i uh, once i do have a database admin user i can start trying to do other things and you know you then end up starting to look at potential lateral movement and you know all of these these things that come with that and this is only one very very small example right um so it, the whole concept of things being configured right um together with the huge amount of data breaches that um we had and we still do right i mean the, there's certainly uh, that certainly hasn't disappeared and also with the limited understanding of how do regulations work in that context um you know in terms of uh shared responsibility and things like that really made it very very difficult and security and compliance have always been considered like hurdles rather than help us when it comes to migrating workloads to to the cloud right um so this really kind of almost looks like the, the the typical or you know the the treaded walkway of how we historically thought about migrating workloads to the cloud now what i would like to do as a as a i guess a thought experiment is just kind of think of this in in a different way and that is Let's start off with security and compliance. Um, not necessarily because, you know, of course I'm I'm biased. I I've been working in the security and compliance space for a long time, but also in terms of what benefits are we creating with that, right? So if we were to set security and compliance as the the chief goal, right? Um, so meaning having at all times a secure and compliant environment that being our achieved goal and with that it doesn't matter where we can start thinking about what are the benefits that we create because of that so of course one being robust security um, strong data integrity reduced business risk you know we can meet our regulatory compliance all the time but interestingly for me um and this is more or less where um a lot of this um this boils down to is once we kind of get together on a table as stakeholders and no matter in what part of um of the bucket you might be and we start understanding that as an organization as a company one of our first and foremost goals has to be building secure reliable compliant anything right so it doesn't matter in, you know in what space you're in whether that's building financial software, um, running pharmacies, um, running pharmaceutical, it, it really doesn't matter because quite frankly, in almost all cases um, in today's business, you will have some data that is important, um, some data that's either regulated or data that's just important to you, like intellectual, uh, intellectual property, things like that. Um, so by looking at this from a security perspective and compliance perspective, you can start actually building out business cases for growth, for um, reducing a lot of the pain points that we talked about earlier in terms of challenges that most of the stakeholders will have, right? So, because if I look at reducing the business risk and you know regulatory require, um, requirements met, that generally translates into risk reduction and generally translates into um, lower overall cost. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean lower overall total cost of ownership, um, but generally lower overall total cost, right? Because I, I don't have to consider as much legal fees, penalties, things like that. Um, but also if I look at um, having robust security and strong data integrity, um, the from an IT perspective, it's gonna make um, patching a lot easier. It's gonna make maintaining a lot easier because everything follows the same kind of patching process. Because quite frankly, and I'm pretty sure a lot of the audience is very familiar with the IT admin space and the system space. The older a system gets, the more outdated the system is, the more difficult it is to maintain and the more 
time consuming, complex, and um, difficult it is to just keep running, right? Um, so uh, depending on from which angle you look at this, you can use uh, security and compliance as a really, really good building block to start bringing different stakeholders together and start using that as your North Star, right? Um, rather than using the actual migrated workload as a North Star, you use the the security aspect and you know the compliance focus as a North Star. It also creates some additional nice benefits in terms of it creates better focus across the um, the teams. Um, it internally kind of reinforces that you take security and compliance and things like that um, easy, uh, easy, <laughs> um, not easy. Yeah, seriously, I was reading something. Um, just reading a um, a message. Sorry, my apology. Someone messaged me on the um, on the chat here for the uh, panelists. Um, but yeah, it, it shows internally that you do take these things seriously. And this kind of reinforces the overall kind of thought of, you know, cloud migration not just being a technical exercise, because uh, quite frankly, it isn't, right? Um, we, we might want to look at it um, like that frequently or because um, it's convenient. But it's not just a technical exercise, right? Um, cloud migration projects include um, many, many different um, areas of the business, not just the technical areas, but um, you know, building that trust with the rest of the business because of the fact that you use um, security and compliance as one of kind of the, the building blocks or the main driver for um, bringing everyone onto the table helps with that, right? Because again, it's not just one team, right? There's many different teams. And of course, it also helps the outside, right? If you're in any way, shape or form um, within an organization that is um, dealing with public customers, uh, which I would assume most of us are, the focus on security and compliance, of course, helps with the overall image and the overall reputation and increases the trust from your customers in, hey, look, you know, just because some of the um, infrastructure is, is migrated to the cloud, that does not mean it is at a higher risk of breach or similar. It could, depending on how you build your, your migration strategy, it could be the opposite, right? It could be way secure than what you what you were able to do cost effectively on on premises, right? But it all comes down to how you make use of that um, as a concept, right? And uh, if, you, if you make use as, you know, security and compliance being your main driver for that, then you have the ability to convey that to internal stakeholders, external stakeholders, customers, investors, um, the market um, at large, and make it a beneficial and positive point, right? So it becomes a business growth driver. Now, when we start thinking about building consent, and I had to put a quote in here. Right. <laughs> Gloria Naylor is a uh, American um, author, but um, it's a very it, it, it's a very fitting um, quote, right? Um, you know, words themselves are innocuous. It's the consensus that gives them true power. So, um, in our uh, without getting too poetic here, right? But in our context, it's very easy to speak about plans. It's very easy to speak about ideas and you know all of these things. But it's really that combined consensus that gives us as a team, as an organization the power to make change, right? And in our case, that is to um, make change in terms of readjusting how we look at, you know, some of these projects like cloud migration projects and making use of the uh, security and compliance aspect as our main driver, right? Um, so, you know, with that, this is what we're starting to, to think about here, right? Is how can we make use of, um, security and compliance as consensus tools, right? So, you know, I've touched on some of these already in terms of um, making use of the external views of the company, how are we viewed, um, making uh, use of bringing the internal stakeholder teams together and really creating um, 
an atmosphere of understanding that by addressing security and compliance as the main driver, as the main topic, most of the other elements will fall into place. So if we go back to that um, funny little um, arrow with the, uh, the potholes in it, by addressing the security and compliance concerns from the get-go as part of our planning and making it part of um, our intent for the cloud migration, we can get rid of most of these um, potholes, most of these um, stumbling stones, if you will. And we can focus on basically the technical challenges rather than having to deal with the technical challenges, the people challenges, as well as the security and compliance challenges. And historically, security concerns have been probably one of the biggest pushback on migrating workloads, right? Um, whether that's because of lack of understanding, whether that's because of lack of funding for you know, uh, what is perceived as the right number of different tool sets. All of these things have historically been um, probably one of the biggest pushbacks on migrating workloads, especially more mission critical workloads, right? Um, so when we, when we start thinking about the different stakeholders again and what the, the different stakeholders have in general as challenges, we can bring it down to, you know, one for each, right? Um, so on the IT team side, security and integrity. On the end user side, it's data security. When we look at it from a, from a security perspective. From a business perspective, from a leadership perspective, it's risk reduction, right? So, and that can mean a lot of things. That's, you know, reducing the risk of being fined, reducing the risk of any sort of data breach, reducing the risk of any sort of auditory mishap, um, any sort of uh, ransomware attack being extorted, uh, all of these things, right? And so each one of the three that we picked, and again, the list of stakeholders, of course, is is much, much bigger than this, but for the sake of, we only have about 40 minutes or 45 minutes in total, I brought it down to the three kind of main ones that we generally deal with in most cases, right? Um, and, you know, these these concerns are valid, right? So, you know, from a security integrity perspective, data security perspective, risk reduction perspective, these are all very valid concerns. But again, by focusing on the security and compliance aspects, we can alleviate most of these from the get-go, right? So we don't have to we don't have to worry about these as we go through the project. Um, so when we if we pick just the the IT team for example, right? Um, so you know what does that translate to as things um, that we can make use of to make that easier for us, right? Of course, so that means we we gotta we gotta architect secure from the get-go, right? Um, we gotta figure out a way to do secure deployment. And we got to understand shared responsibilities, especially you know when it comes to the cloud vendors. And this list is almost endlessly long, right? So I could continue with, well, of course you got to ensure that you have a cloud service provider that has good compliance certifications, um, has good data re residency um, available, right? So being able to pick a location that's within your geographical region. Um, is able to have good access control, um, has maybe good ways of doing multi-factor authentication for the IT teams. And like I said, you know, the, the list is is endless, more or less. Um, but when we look at this, most of these are, you could roll into the, these three areas, right? So architecting secure, well, that in, includes everything from how do I get access to the workload? Who is allowed to have access to, you know, the particular workload? Um, what's going to happen if a, if a workload is no longer in use? What's going to happen if a particular person leaves? Does that person still have access? All of these things are effectively rolled into architecting secure, secure deployment. Same principle. You got to think about how you deploy securely. Um, you got to make sure that you understand what the the different roles and the different um, access levels are. Um, got to make sure that you have good ways of ensuring up-to-date software on your workloads. Um, that's, you know, we're talking patching and things like that. And then there's the shared responsibility aspect, which really kind of covers most of what we need to think about from a compliance perspective, right? Because there are certain things that, depending on what type of 
cloud migration strategy you, you're using. So whether you know, you're talking um, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, um, software as a service, each one of these has certain differences when it comes to who's responsible for what, right? But understanding these from a security perspective and getting this squared away early, what, while you're still going through that consensus building with the rest of your stakeholders will give you a lot of tools and a lot of firepower that you can bring to the table to really drive the discussion towards the migration subject, right? Because if you can prepare all of this prior to going into or as part of the, the initial uh, consensus building efforts, then you will remove most of the concerns that any of the other stakeholders might bring. And you can start using that then to build um, overall understanding that, you know, by using security and compliance as the initial starting point, you can move much faster and you can effectively remove a lot of the, the initial concerns, right? Um, and, you know, again, I've only picked the IT team as a, um, as an example, uh, we could do the same exercise for uh, the end users. Um, we could do the same exercise for the business leaders, whether that's the exec team or um, BU leaders and so on and so forth. Um, and the, the point here is that you can almost bring all of the main initial concerns back to some form of a security related or compliance related point. And by doing this as part of the initial exercise and you start the, the project or the migration project off on that foot, it allows you to kind of push the cloud migration effort past the initial hurdles of most of the, the major concerns, apart from, of course, financing and cost and things like that. Um, that's, of course, it's a slightly different, slightly different conversation. But generally speaking, it allows you to build um, to build a much stronger case um, because, quite frankly, almost everyone in, in, in the organization will understand that overall security and compliance, while often considered as the bane of our existence, um, is very, very powerful. And if we do it right, and we must do it right, it's not a it's not really a choice, right, because, you know, it can take 20 years to build a company's reputation. It takes 10 minutes to ruin it, um, depending on you know what the uh, what the data breach was. So I think we all innately understand how important it is. It, this just kind of puts the spotlight on trying to rally around that topic and use that topic then to push the cloud migration um, projects rather than it becoming just a, a hurdle or a you know. Some, some form of an inconvenience as part of the, the project, this makes it the centerpiece of the cloud migration project and, and therefore helps push it further, right? So let's have a look at a few examples. Um, and by examples, really, it's a little bit like looking at migration plans and things like that, because quite frankly, every company is different and it'd be, it'd be virtually impossible for me to come up with examples um, that would be applicable to anyone bar maybe one person in the audience, right? So really the examples are kind of looking a little bit at um, different types of migration plans and some of the best practices around that. So one of the things that, you know, um, you probably should be looking at, um, especially when you're kind of using a more security and compliance centric or focused um, way of trying to convince and build um, agreement with the rest of of your team. So this is a this is a really um, really straightforward example. Um, but the one big question, you know, if I would do this in a room, I would ask for a show of hands. But we're virtual, so that's a little, a little bit difficult. But where is security, right? And uh, unfortunately, this is not the exception, right? Because it depends on who builds the migration plan. If Whoever is building the migration plan does not necessarily consider security or compliance part of either their immediate um, area of responsibility 
or even part of the thought process because it's really all about the architectural bits and uh, the design phase, right? Then you end up with this, right? Where you have a five-stage process, um, a five-stage migration plan that does not really address any sort of security concerns in any way, shape, or form, unfortunately. So this is not uncommon. Um, now, there's others, of course, right? So this is an, an example from AWS. Um, not necessarily saying this is the gold standard, but this this is one example from um, AWS with a phased approach. This is six stages, but you can see in the very first stage, in the cloud assessment stage, we have already assessed security, right? And this is really important, not just because we got to figure out, you know, what we're, you know, what we're migrating and whether there is any any sort of potential security issues that we're, you know, possibly migrating with the migration. But it's figuring out what are the security requirements that we have, what are the things that we um, that we need to make sure when we migrate to the cloud. And going back to the um, architect secure bit that I was um, talking about earlier on, it's about figuring out where can we make improvements that we're basically getting for free, right? Um, what are the things that we can make use of in the, the different um, architecture that will allow us to be more security conscious, um, that will allow us to be more compliance conscious, um, yet provide the same level of service back to the business and maybe better um, for um, a higher level of security and compliance in this particular case, right? So there, there's many different um, aspects to this one. So, but this is another kind of standard um, um, migration plan, but I guess the, the elements of a strong, you know, migration plan really is um, the assessment at the beginning, right? Really understanding what your, what your environment has, um, what's, what's the workloads that you, that you will migrate? Um, what are the workloads that you, um, will lift and shift? What are the workloads that you will um, do pass? What are the workloads that you will do infrastructure as a service? Um, so lift and shift. What are the, the workloads that you want to remove and purchase as SaaS? All of this is part of that first assessment phase where really most, most of the time needs to be spent. And again, if you look at that from a security perspective um, and a compliance perspective, you will see that some of those decisions might be different to what you would have looked at purely from an infrastructure perspective. So it's really worthwhile to think of these um, from various different points, and especially in the context of um, the discussion here in terms of making use of security compliance as a, as a way to kind of create um, agreement and consensus among the stakeholders of course, you know, the aim is to look at it through the security um, lens, right? And uh, really start looking at what can we, what can we achieve um, in terms of level of security by going to the cloud platform provider, right? And uh, really also making the choice of the cloud platform provider um, as part of, as part of that. So in terms of best practices, Again, there's there's certainly many different ways of looking at best practices, right? Um, of course, there's the technical best practices, and um, this is certainly not the right format to go through the technical best practices. And I think it would require way more than um, 45 minutes or an hour to get even, even anywhere close to talking about the technical best practices. But from an overall business perspective and as a stakeholder or as part of the stakeholders um, of you know setting up a project for cloud migration, what are some of the best practices that we probably should be thinking about when we think about um, getting a project like you know migrating parts of our infrastructure or even everything um, into the cloud? Um, of course, plan, right? So we've touched on that when we looked at the migration plans. Um, 
those things got to be planned and they got to be thought through quite quite well um of course because there's huge implications in terms of financial risk all of these things so i think that's a given right um communicate often right um especially when it comes to uh, internal um teams outside of your e immediate stakeholders right so everyone else who's involved in 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 this or might be involved in this um communicate clear and communicate often um especially communicate about the benefits um and also communicate about the changes right so you know these things should never come as surprises right so um validate your security right so but i mean you know validate what you have and add if you need to right so have a really good understanding that when you're going through that process your tooling might change right so this is one of the uh, the areas where you could potentially increase your your security posture quite dramatically for very little to no additional cost if at all right um but it depends you have to validate what's what's there you have to validate what you have currently in use what does it cover and you have to validate how does it translate into um your cloud workloads again the question of what in terms of um IaaS, PaaS, SaaS is going to be a big question because each one of these are going to be different when it comes to the security requirements right so if i don't own the infrastructure if i don't own the workload if i only own the app and the data then of course i don't need to think about um, a lot of the underlying infrastructure security i only need to think about and only i'm using airports um, i only need to think about the application security and the data security so the the spectrum obviously changes right with the type of workload and uh, but that has to be part of the the beginning of you know stage one stage two of assessing what you've got assess what what you've got in terms of your security tooling um and uh, of course also assess your compliance right um especially and that's really really germane to the whole compliance um topic simply because of the fact that you might end up with data residency issues if you are not careful right um because of the fact that in some cases, um, data can potentially leave the sovereign area of wherever it is that you and your your data resides. So you got to be really, really careful, and you got to be really um, understanding um, on where is that data sitting, and how does that affect your compliance? Are there any additional compliance requirements that you might uh, now have to fulfill? Um, and uh, have your cloud service providers that you've looked at and the ones that you've kind of pre-chosen or are part of your initial POC, um, do they have any specific compliance certifications, anything that you, you know, you might need? Again, if we're looking at it from a, um, from a vendor's perspective, if you're in the government space and you might need to use GovCloud or something like that, or a equivalent, depending on the vendor, all of these things have to be part of your compliance assessment and you know what's what's really required set up good kpis right you've got to be able to measure um you know if it doesn't if you can't measure it doesn't exist right so whether that's performance uh whether that's um vulnerabilities uh, whether that's uh, compliance adherence to whatever standard it is that you need to adhere to you got to set up clear kpis that you can measure and you can compare Right, because as much as we all want to work, um, you know, through a cloud migration project and have a successful cloud migration project, in a lot of cases, for some workloads, that's just not feasible, and they're better off um, staying on premises for now. But you only will only figure that out once you have identified your kind of top ten metrics that you need to that you need to really measure. Um, and I kind of touch on that benchmark and optimize, right? So once you've once you understood your KPIs and you understood what, what they mean, then you can start benchmarking and you can start looking at, can I optimize or am I at the end, right? And if I'm at the end and I'm way far away from where I need to be, then the question is, does it make sense for that workload to be a cloud workload? Or you know, maybe it makes more sense to for that workload to be staying on time, right? Um, you gotta codify your monitoring workflows, right? So that is, and I would even say not 
just your monitoring workflows, but I would say you got to codify all of your workflows um, because the age-old topic of what happens if I win the lottery tomorrow um, is probably even more crucial when it comes to um, migrating workloads into the cloud because there are so many different aspects of potentially different areas that need to be tweaked that you might end up with a real big problem if you don't codify all of those workflows. There has to be centralized places where that data is available um, so that if, God forbid, something happens and you need to make use of that, um, you know exactly the steps that are required um, for any given workflow, right? So I, I would extend that to not just the, uh, the monitoring workflow. Um, and again, ensure data portability and interoperability. So again, making sure that you can move data from one place to another, right? So from on-prem to the cloud and backwards, um, if if need be. That's you know really important when it comes to um, being able to quickly turn back if you have to, or quickly add additional resources if you have to. All right, um, we're coming to the end, and I can see some people are already dropping off. So really, that's pretty much all there was. We have a summary at the end of this. Um, it really, again, the idea here is to bring all of this together a little bit into a way for you to use security and compliance instead of as an obstacle, um, as a way to build consensus and as a way to build common agreement because it, you're no longer looking at it as some form of a um, some form of a problem along the way of getting into um, migrating your workloads into the cloud, but it becomes part of your your overall um, your overall idea and target of what what your workloads in general should be like. So the place becomes less relevant. So whether it's on premises or whether it's in in the cloud. So I hope for we had a relatively small audience, so I hope for everyone who was um, here, there was um, some interesting nuggets in there for you. Um, and like I said at the very beginning, um, I hope everyone, wherever you are, have um, as nice of a weather as I'm pleasant um, uh, and pleased with right here. So um, I'm going to leave at this and going to see if there is um, any questions. Uh, any comments? If not, you know, I'll leave the session open for another minute, but um, I thank you all very much. Mm -hmm.